Okay, we're back with the Alpha Yoke from Honeycomb Aeronautical. And I should say at the outset, this video probably isn't going to improve your experience of using the yoke, with the possible exception of your setup of FSU IPC. You, so you need to pay attention to that. The other thing is, I'm not going to try and talk you out of buying a Honeycomb yoke. I think this is a great yoke, and if you're upgrading from one of the, I suppose, low end yokes, it's still a fantastic upgrade, and this is going to serve you very well. But it has dead zones, which is something that surprised a lot of people and nobody really knows why it has dead zones. So I thought it would just be interesting to think a little bit about what we know and what we can speculate along those lines. And it's just interesting when these things get talked about and debated. You know, when you poke around and start to think about it, things are really never quite as straightforward as you imagine. So, so I thought that was interesting and here we are, we're going to talk about this. So right away, in terms of things being less straightforward than you imagine, if you have a critical eye and you watched my original Honeycomb Alpha Yoke review carefully, there were a couple of things you could have jumped on. One thing in particular is the reliance on you know, demonstrating the dead zones. I was showing the movement of the physical yoke alongside the movement of the virtual cockpit yoke. Now that's an unreliable thing to do. I mean, it's a useful way to illustrate the point, but in terms of specific reliability of watching that animation in the virtual cockpit it's not really a good test because that cockpit animation well I don't know too much about the implementation of the aircraft visual models in FSX but I'm given to understand and it's very logical that that animation in the virtual cockpit is, is made up of a small number of relatively small number of keyframes and depending on how many keyframes there there are you know the positions that are rendered may not be precisely reflecting the positions of the control surfaces themselves. Now you can go and look at the control surfaces themselves by looking at the external view but the same thing really applies. You know at the end of the day that's an animation you're watching that somewhat faithfully mimics the movements of the controls but there'll be a limited number of keyframes so the resolution of that animation may not be a complete, well first of all it may not be a completely accurate guide in terms of the degree of precision that you can read into what you actually see on the screen but also again, it, you know, there's no reason why that visual representation of the control surfaces can be reliably assumed to follow the position of the control surfaces in, in the actual, you know, the internal programmatic workings of the aircraft simulation. So we can go on and delve deeper. We can look at the actual variables inside of FSX or prepared in this case and examine the positions of the control surfaces more reliably. I mean we can compare them with what we see on the screen and, and of course we could compare them with what we see in the visual animation of the control surfaces and, and indeed the control column in the virtual cockpit but importantly we can rely on those numbers as an accurate reflection of what the aircraft model is being asked to do as a consequence of the position of the physical yoke. And you can look at those internal variables, there's pro probably a number of ways of monitoring those but I use a free program called AFSD which allows access I think to a comprehensive set of the internal FSX and prepared variables. So that's the first thing that you could have looked at in my original video and criticised. You know, perhaps I should have been looking at the AFSD values. But no matter, you know, despite the granularity if you like, or the, the presumed granularity of that animation of the yoke in the virtual cockpit, you know, for the purposes of demonstration, we were still clearly getting a pause while we were passing through the centre. Now, the second thing you might have criticised in my original review video was where I was demonstrating the dead zone by looking at the FSU IPC output values. Now, the keen-eyed observer will note that those FSU IPC values were changing in increments of, well, approximately 256. And given that the FSU IPC values are scaled in a range from minus 16k to plus 16k, so a, a total range of 32k, that means if you do the arithmetic, we were only going to sense 128 independent positions of the yoke. Now that's significant because it's not very many. 127 is 2 to the power of 7, which means we're effectively sampling a 7-bit data value from the yoke. Now that's really low. And Now I had presumed, again, something I said in my original video has become a little bit clearer, 
when we were looking at the Windows calibration screen, I noted that the values were changing between 0 and 255. And I, I had concluded that that's because Windows in that screen was scaling down the actual data values from the yolk. In fact, Windows doesn't do that. The yolk, it has now become clear, supplies 8-bit data, which means it's somewhere inside this box it has potentiometers that are sampled with an analog to digital converter with a resolution of 8 bits. Now I know that because Nicky Repenning said that in a... well I'm presuming this is reliable. I mean Nicky said this in a, an interview uh, but actually what he said was slightly curious. I'm sure he knows what he's talking about but the way he expressed that was he said we have in this yoke high-end 8-bit potentiometers. Now you know potentiometers are analog devices. They don't have bits associated with them. The the number of bits is the, is the sample size introduced by the analog to digital converter. Now so I'm not really sure what to make of that but the best info that we have to date is that this yoke supplies 8-bit analog data which means we should be able to sense 256 different yoke positions. Now the reason we were only seeing 127 positions in FSU IPC is down to how you set it up and how it's set up by default so we'll dive into that in just a minute. But one thing that becomes clear when you start to poke around with these different ways of investigating this kind of problem is that there are many different ways to look at what's going on inside the, the yolk and inside the sim in terms of numerical values, the data being passed backwards and forwards and depending on which tool you use you, know, you may draw different and perhaps incorrect conclusions about what you see. I mean to date we've seen various ways of looking at the data. We've, we've seen the Windows Game Controller calibration screen, we've seen FSU IPC, we've seen AFSD, we've seen the visual representations of the control column in the virtual cockpit, we've seen the visual representation of the control surfaces themselves in the external model. Um, the gold standard for looking at your joystick values is a thing called DI view, which, which has been around for ages. It's a program that's, I think, supplied by Logitech. Uh, and, you know, what's kind of notable about these things is they display the data on different scales. So DI view shows the data on a scale from, I think, plus 64K to minus 64K. So that's a huge range of data. And, of course, that means that's a very, very precise scale. And, indeed, it's much more precise than many of the devices you plug into Windows. So... This device, we're presuming, has supplies 8-bit data, so that's 256 positions. By way of contrast, um, a standard joystick controller would be a 10-bit controller. Some of the higher-end ones, I think, certainly the MFG crosswind pedals have a 12-bit controller. So, so the crosswind pedals can sample 4,096 separate positions. But, but when you look at the crosswind pedals or the honeycomb yoke or the Yoko yoke in DI view you're seeing those data that those data values scaled onto a 64k scale so the values that you see there are not raw data values supplied by the device you have to be careful about interpreting the specifics of what you see so again if we looked at this in DI view as we rotated the yoke although those numbers look very precise we're going to see that they don't vary smoothly. They'll vary in steps, if you like, and the size of the step depends on the particular da data range. We'll see that when we look at FSU IPC in a minute. I've got aileron and I've got elevator on the alpha yoke. If we go to the joystick calibration screen, um, we, we can watch those values. I've already calibrated this, so we've got zero in the center, no null zone set here. Look at the ailerons here. Now you see those values go from minus 16k to plus 16k. Again, that's scaled. Don't forget this joystick device is only inputting an 8-bit value, so that's a much higher resolution value. That's a 15-bit value. Now that's pertinent. If we go back to the axis assignment screen, we have a value here called delta. Um, if I just rescan, make sure I'm looking at the ailerons. Delta is 256. That is the smallest change in value that 
FSU IPC is going to report to the SIM. Now, in principle, FSU IPC can distinguish between 32,768 different positions of the oak. Now, of course, depending on your input device, we may or may not get that precision. But let's say we had a device that was capable of producing a 15-bit value. If we set our delta value to 1 here, that means that the slightest change in position of that input device would be reported and there would be messages flying around in Windows to send that to the flight sim. And the problem with that is we get an awful lot of messages. So what you can do is you can instruct FSU IPC to report coarser control movements if you like. If you set that delta to um, 2, effectively you're dividing the precision by 2, so we get a 14-bit resolution if you like. If you divide it by 256, which is the default, we'd get, I mean if we had a truly 15-bit input device we'd be getting a massive reduction in precision. And of course the benefit there is we don't clog things up by making the Windows messaging system do far more work than it needs to do. Now the default setting for this delta is 256 and what that should show us is if we go to the calibration screen if we watch those, if I try and turn the yoke as slowly as I can, ailerons again remember, so we're, we're zero at the center position no null zone, if I turn it as small, smaller movement as I can until we get a, a change in those numbers that goes to 258 why is that 258, not 256? Now here's a case in point. I did say that these things always turn out to be more complex than you expect. What I'm expecting here is that these smallest movements will be detected in steps of 256. Now the first step away from the centre we're getting 258. That's an error or an addition of 2 onto 256. Then we should expect 512 and we're getting an addition of a, another 2. So instead of 512 we're getting 516, 774, it should be 768, so we're getting, so for some reason we're getting steps of 258 instead of 256, don't understand why that is, but it's approximately 256. So what we're seeing there is, with the delta set to 256, we're not getting the full precision of the yoke. Now I know this because if you divide that um, calibrated range of 32k, 2 to the power of 15, by the delta value 256 you get 128 so that means that uh, in this configuration with a delta value of 256 we can only detect 128 different positions and that's going to short change this honeycomb yoke so what do we need to do well if we divide 32k by the stated resolution of the yoke which is 256 we get 128 and that means if we set the value of the delta to 128 or less we should be able to use the full resolving power of this yoke. Now how do we do that? Um, this is a bit fiddly in FSU obviously. I don't think you can just type those values. So I have to pr press the delta button, move the yoke a small amount, press it again, then we'll get 129 there. That's, again, that's, that's congruent with the inexplicable error we just saw. I would have expected that to be 128, the smallest detectable value, and for some reason it's 129. I don't know why that is, but if we go to joystick calibration and move the yoke in small steps now, we should see steps of 128, or in fact 129. 129, 258 instead of 256, 387, ugh, and so on. So now we have the full resolution of that yoke in the aileron direction. So why does this, or why might this device have dead zones? It feels very precise in pitch and roll. It centers assertively. You know, we might presume that there's some mechanical reason for, we, you know, I don't know what the internal, well I don't know firsthand what the internal mechanism looks like, but my initial guess really on why this would have dead zones was that there might be something in the, the mechanics. Now I'm saying that with some in, well, I'm saying insight, you know, <laughs> I don't know if it's insight or not, but some knowledge of the internals of some of the other yokes. I have dismantled a CH product yoke and a SciTech ProFlight yoke, and, you know, the mechanisms are probably more complex than you imagine, but to cut a long story short, people have opened up this yoke and investigated this, and 
you know, it seems pretty clear that the mechanism is sound. This uses a linear potentiometer for the pitch axis and a, and a what do you call it, a radial potentiometer for the roll axis. And in, in each case, you know, the mechanism is very simple. That there's no obvious mechanical reason why there would be any interruption in the data values passing through the centre. And I say that, you know, there's two or three people who have opened up the yoke, have seen photographs of it and reports from people. So I think we have to discount that theory as the reason for the dead zones. Now another precedent that we have to work on is the SciTech ProFlight yoke, which is, which is widely cited as having a, a dead zone. Now this is, any, this is not to be confused with the central detente, the mechanical detente that the SciTech ProFlight yoke has. It's also widely recognized as having a, a kind of a built-in dead zone in the uh, what electrical values that, that the thing outputs, or the data values output by the A to D converter. And I, in researching one of my videos, I pretty much convinced myself that that was the case. And it's generally recognized that that is built in in, in, I suppose, firmware in, in some sense. You know, somewhere inside this yoke and, and every similar yoke, we have a step where the linear position of the potentiometer, which is an analog device, is sampled into di a digital value, and then those digital values are in turn output using some agreed hardware and software protocol. Uh, and so that, you know, we don't know how that's done. Somewhere in there, maybe there's a chip with, you know, a program that, that does that conversion. And who's to say that that doesn't fiddle with the values around the central position? It maybe just did a data lookup table or something like something like that. But it's firmware. It's it's embedded, you know, it's software, but it's a, a lower level. It's embedded somehow on a on a chip. You know, in the old days, that would be on a ROM or an EEPROM. But why would why would that make sense? Well, it, you know, in my estimation. A good reason for doing that would be if you were making cheap joysticks, you know, with cheap mechanisms in, then having a pre-programmed null zone in your A to D conversion would make some kind of sense because it would cover up any sloppiness in the mechanism, and and your stick would centre assertively, even even if the mechanics were a little bit imprecise. So we have to presume that that's a possibility for the honeycomb yoke. Now, Nikki Repenning again has said in response to a specific criticism about dead zones, that there is absolutely no reason why there should be a dead zone. So it's clearly not something that was designed into the yoke with his knowledge. But I wonder if it's something that, you know, crept in in the selection of the components. I mean, this thing is obviously going to be built from standard... Com well, I'm, I'm saying obviously, maybe that this was completely de designed from the ground up, that the joystick controller and the A to D stages were all designed from scratch, but that seems very unlikely. It seems very likely that off-the-shelf components were used, you know, the potentiometers would have been selected from a, somebody's catalogue, the A to D conversion, and the possibly even the entire joystick controller is an off-the-shelf component. Now interestingly enough, this is something you can go in and investigate if you have the right tools. I use Linda, which is a joystick mapping tool, if you like, that sits on top of FSU IPC. Of course, Linda understands human interface devices of many kinds, joystick controllers by another name. Now, if you know about HID, human interface devices, you will know that the protocol through which they communicate with Windows mandates that they provide a vendor ID and a product ID and also a unit ID. So, so if you take, let's say, for example, the SciTech ProFlight throttle quadrants, you can plug several of those in, they're identical units, you can plug in several at a time via USB, they will each have the same vendor ID, they will have the same product ID, but they will have successively increment, incremented unit IDs, that allows them to be distinguished uniquely in Windows. So if we fire up Linda and look at the Honeycomb Alpha yoke, we find a vendor ID of 294B, that's, these are hexadecimal numbers and a product ID of 190. Uh, now that doesn't immediately tell us anything, but you can go and look in. There are, I mean, the, the point of these IDs is that they can be collated in tables and, and people who are producing products such as 
prepared or Xplane or FSX and so on, they can actually recognize devices specifically and that allows them to you know, pre-program control mappings and so on. And you will be able to find on the web tables of vendors and product IDs. And if you do that you'll discover that 294B is a vendor ID that identifies as Snakebite Asia Limited. Now that's intriguing for two reasons. One is if you, if you do a bit of googling you'll quickly discover that Snakebite is somehow associated with the Honeycomb Aeronautical brand. As someone else did say that if you phone up Honeycomb Aeronautical the phone is answered as Snakebite. <laughs> so that's a bit of, I mean this sounds like a detective story I and mean, none of this is secret presumably but it's just intriguing. And the other thing about that's interesting about Snakebite, if you look into what they do, a significant proportion of their product line is in producing PlayStation 4 controllers. And this leads us, really, it suggests that some of the components inside of this device are indeed off the shelf and they're products that you may find also in Snakebite's controllers. Now that's not necessarily a bad thing. My understanding from a quick investigation of Snakebite products is they're relatively low cost alternatives to the official Sony branded controllers. Now, I don't know who makes the Sony controllers, but it may be that investigating PS4 controllers made by Snakebite will turn up other comments on dead zones. Now this leads to my best guess, or my newest best guess, about what, how to understand the dead zone problem or issue. Let's not call it a problem. With the Honeycomb controller. And that is, this comes back to something I mentioned in my in my original review video as well. This thing about the interplay between the long travel of the honeycomb yoke and the design of things like FSX and P3D which were created for short travel devices. Now thinking about PS4 controller, this is a PS3 controller but same deal, you know these analog joysticks have got very short throw. And they're very small so they're short handle, but also short throw. You know, that's probably not even 45 degrees. That's probably like a 30 degree side to side. So total 60 degree throw uh, and very short. And, you know, it seems to be thinking through the mechanics of that. Having a, let's imagine we had the same controller in this device and in this device. And there's a dead zone in the axis left to right. That dead zone is going to be much less obtrusive on such a short throw device and indeed the size of that dead zone presuming it is engineered in there deliberately is chosen to to match the scale of the mechanical throw of this joystick if we take that same device put it into something like this with a massively different throw we're going to amplify that dead zone and my hunch is that's what's happened here you know some stage of the development of this yoke, somebody's taken a joystick controller off the shelf without making changes to it and an unintended consequence of that is that dead zone has become very large and noticeable. Now I could be completely wrong about this and you know, it seems more likely that someone has done that with a little bit of forethought, perhaps reprogram reprogrammed that dead zone to be on a different scale but you know, maybe that hasn't yet been refined to precisely match the capabilities of this yoke. So there you go, that's my theory for what it's worth. I'm sure we're going to see a lot more talk about this and possibly some explanation will emerge. Uh, but the good news is if this is a firmware issue, I mean it depends really how the firmware is managed. There should be a way to flash a new version of that firmware onto the yoke without even taking it off your desk. I mean the worst case scenario would be that that's not flashable, it's in a chip that's soldered onto the board and the only way to to fix it would be to <laughs> take the chip off the board and replace it or more likely throw the board away. Um, we've got to presume that's not going to be how it is. So in due course we may find that there's a simple software updatable solution to the dead zone issue. But for now that's just a whole bunch of interesting things to think about. And at the end of the day, it's not really getting in the way of flying this yoke around.